Welcome to Micro Terrors. Scary stories for kids. Where it's always the spooky season. Full of chills. Thrills. And spine tingling spooks. Micro Terrors are family friendly frights for those ages 8 and up. And while our stories are for younger ears, we are still talking about things that go bump in the night, and some children may not be able to handle what others can. Parental consent is recommended. Now, for tonight's Micro Terror. The Grove City Werewolf, written by Scott Donnelly. August was in full swing in Grove City, Ohio. A late October chill creeped through the night air, stirring up leaves and rustling the naked branches of the trees in Andrea Cordell's backyard. Sitting by her crackling fire pit and wrapped tightly in an Ohio State football hoodie, she typed on her laptop, putting the final touches on her Trick or Treat Safety Tips article for the Grove City Messenger, the local publication she worked for. Her phone rang silencing the crickets in her backyard, and she answered it. Hello? She said. Andrea, I just wanted to check to see how the werewolf article was coming, a man's voice said. Andrea sighed. I told you I'm not doing the werewolf article. I don't believe in things like that, and I feel like this town has gotten itself worked up into a little panic over nothing. It's the spooky season, she said. Of course something like this would be trying to make headlines around town. It sounds like a fluff piece to me. Andrea? The man said. I think we need to cover it. There's a curfew in effect. The police don't put a curfew in effect for fluff pieces. Andrea sighed. But before she could respond, she heard something in the trees. Her backyard hugged to the edge of a small wooded area. Oh, hold on, she whispered into the phone. Andrea held the phone down by her side and tried to focus her eyes on the dark tree line ahead of her. Everything went silent, aside from the crackling fire. Then, without warning, a vicious, arcane howl erupted from the woods. Andrea panicked and jumped to her feet. She ran for the back door of her house. That's when she heard the heavy, persistent gallop of a large animal behind her. Clamoring through the backyard after her, snarling wickedly, she blew through the back door and slammed it shut. As Andrea tried to settle her nerves and catch her breath, she heard the haunting howl of the unseen beast again, echoing in the cold night outside. After the 45-minute trip, Sean Dyer's family car finally came to a stop. With his father behind the wheel and his mother in the passenger seat, they pulled into the driveway of a small little house off Kingston Avenue in Grove City, Ohio. Sean's dad turned the engine off and opened his door. His mother did the same but Sean remained seated, strapped in with his seatbelt, nervous to leave the comforts of the family car. "'You coming?' his dad called back in, a cool rush of the crisp autumn air slipping in through the open door. Sean sighed. Even though he didn't want to, even though he wanted to go with his parents to North Carolina for the weekend, instead of staying with family that he barely ever saw, he knew it was a lost cause." The plane tickets were already paid for, only two of them, and his aunt and uncle were expecting them. Chances were they had probably already noticed the car pull into the driveway. Sean glanced out the window and up to the house. His aunt and uncle, who he hadn't seen in about two years, were standing on the porch, waving with huge smiles on their faces. Yep, they already knew. It didn't take long for Sean's parents to get him settled in unpacked and reacquainted with his dad's brother and his wife. Uncle Curtis was a good man, with a good job. He liked bad movies, even worse music, and still favored the video games of his youth to the ones of today, well into his thirties. His wife, Aunt Jade, was as friendly as someone could be. Sean hadn't been in their home for two minutes before Aunt Jade had offered to make him hot chocolate and homemade pumpkin cookies. As much as Sean wanted to feel comfortable, he struggled. It's only for the weekend, he told himself. Then Mom and Dad will be back and I'll be heading home, just in time for Halloween. 
Sean's parents had been gone for only an hour when Sean felt the first nervous butterfly in his stomach. It was like the butterfly was lost, tying aimless knots inside of him. He was homesick. Sean found his way outside and sat on the porch steps. He breathed in the cool autumn air, watched the leaves trickle down from the trees, and took a gander at the Halloween decorations his aunt and uncle's neighbors had on full display. It was the first time he felt like smiling, but still couldn't muster up the energy to do so. The front door behind him opened and Uncle Curtis came out, sitting down next to Sean with a cup of steaming hot chai tea in his hands. Do it okay? he asked. Sean nodded. Uncle Curtis took a small sip from his tea and looked around the neighborhood. I love this neighborhood at Halloween time, he said, looking at the blowing spiderweb decorations across the street, the inflatable vampire Bluey next door to it, and the skeletal spider that had been fastened atop a nearby mailbox. It reminds me of the neighborhood your dad and I grew up in. Uncle Curtis looked down to Sean and, after another sip of tea, said, I still can't believe he's moving you all to North Carolina. I wish he wasn't, Sean said. I like Ohio. Uncle Curtis took a deep breath. Me too, especially Grove City. I've lived here with Aunt Jade for nearly a decade now. It's the perfect small town feel, but close enough to everything big, it's the best of both worlds. Sean didn't seem interested, and Uncle Curtis noticed. He smiled. I'll take you for a tour tomorrow, Uncle Curtis said. Just you and me. Jade has some work stuff to do anyways. I'll show you all the cool things around town. There's a comic book store, parks, some of the best pizza you'll ever have. Uncle Curtis trailed off on his pizza comment, and Sean couldn't tell if it was because he was trying to think of other places to mention or that he now had a hankering for pizza. Just then, the sound of footsteps crunching through leaves caught Sean's attention. He looked up and saw a mail carrier, a middle-aged man dressed in the standard blue uniform and carrying a satchel filled with letters and small parcels, walking through the neighbor's yard and into his aunt and uncle's. Uncle Curtis stood up. Good afternoon, Jeff! He greeted his neighborhood mailman with a smile. Jeff, the mailman, briefly eyed the sky. The sun was already heading toward the horizon, leaving a bright orange glow in the sky. More like evening, Jeff said, handing Curtis a handful of letters. Just trying to get done before dark. Sean noticed something strange in Jeff's tone when he mentioned trying to get done before dark. It didn't seem to come from a place of work-related distress, but from somewhere else. Curtis's demeanor changed as well. His friendly greeting trailed off, just as his pizza comment did moments earlier. Be safe, Jeff. Get back and get home as soon as you can. Jeff nodded with a smile. This is my last street before I'm done, so I think I'm in the clear. Hopefully. Curtis smiled. See you tomorrow. You too. Jeff smiled and then nodded in Sean's direction before moving on to the next house. As Curtis sat back down on the porch step, Sean kept his eye on Jeff, hurrying through the leaf-covered yard. Jeff's been our mail carrier for years, Curtis said to Sean. Good guy. He just lost his brother a couple of weeks back. He hasn't met himself since then. I can't imagine losing someone that close to me." Sean didn't verbally respond, but just watched Jeff cross the yard into the next one. The neighbor's front door opened and a dog rushed out to greet Jeff with a friendly wag of its tail. A man appeared at the door next. He looked to be in his late twenties. The man accepted a handful of mail from Jeff before the nervous mailman hurried on his way again. The neighbor then turned and waved to Sean. Sean hesitantly waved back and Curtis noticed. That's Reese, Curtis said. He's lived there since before Jade and I moved in. Nice guy. He's doing some work in his attic that he keeps asking my help with, but I keep finding new ways to blow him off. <laughs> Reese rounded up his dog and the two of them disappeared back into their house. He's got a nice dog, Sean said. Most dogs I know hate the mailman. <laughs> yeah, Bongo is one of a kind. Bongo? <laughs> Sean laughed, realizing that he had finally broken a smile. And it felt good. Curtis, noticing this as well, decided to capitalize on a craving that had been building within him. Want pizza for dinner? he asked, 
There's a place on Broadway called Tabby's Pizza. It's the best you'll ever have, I promise. Sean smiled again. I could eat some pizza. Pizza it is, Curtis said, standing up and swallowing the last gulp of his tea. He looked to the sunset, and his tone slightly changed again. Ooh, we'd better hurry, though. It'll be dark soon. Sean couldn't help but wonder. Why did everyone seem so nervous about the dark? Uncle Curtis pulled his car along the curb of Broadway, right in front of Tammy's Pizza. The establishment was much smaller than Sean would have predicted, but he'd always been told the smaller the place, the better the food. I'll be right back, Curtis said, turning off the car and taking the keys with him. As soon as he opened the car door to leave, Sean could already smell the pizza, and it smelled incredible. While his uncle went inside to pick up and pay for it, Sean looked out the windows, getting his first real look at downtown Grove City. It did have that small-town feel like his uncle had said. Shops, restaurants, and businesses lined both sides of Broadway. Festival fall flags hung on the light poles and Halloween decorations sat inside the glass windows of the businesses. The orange glow in the sky had become blinding for a moment and then dulled. The sun had set, and the lingering light made the sky look beautiful. However, it wouldn't last long. It was just after 6 p.m., and it would be dark very soon. There was a knock on the passenger window, which startled a gasp from Sean. He looked up and saw a uniformed police officer. Once Sean caught his breath, he cracked the door open, a familiar knot of nerves running to his stomach. Yes? he asked. Where are your parents? the officer asked. M my uncle's in there, Sean said, pointing behind the officer to Tammy's Pizza. He's getting our dinner. The officer turned around just in time to see Curtis coming out with two large pizzas in his hands. Is there a problem, officer? Curtis asked. Son's setting, the officer said. There's a curfew in effect. Unless you have to be on the road, you shouldn't be. I understand, Curtis said. We're on our way home now, actually. The officer nodded. He looked back down at Sean and then addressed Curtis. Keep your nephew safe, he said. I will, Curtis replied. The officer then walked away, and Curtis sat the pizzas in the back seat of the car. He climbed into the driver's seat and started it up. Why is there a curfew? Sean asked curiously. Curtis didn't answer for a minute. There's... there's just been some strange things happening around here lately. He turned to Sean and faked a smile. Nothing to worry about. Curtis faced forward and stepped on the gas. He pulled out into traffic and drove the two of them home. Oddly, he didn't mention anything else about the curfew, which only made Sean more curious. A little over an hour later, across town, Grove City's coolest store, Skylark's Toys and Comics, saw its last customer of the night leave. Darren Neff, the store's bearded, humble owner, adjusted his ball cap, which sported the Skylark's logo, and then locked the door. He peered out into the night, but couldn't see much because of the glare from the light inside the store. He turned off the buzzing, open sign, locked the door, and then returned to his place behind the counter. The cash register opened, and Darren began to count the drawer. Then, something in his peripheral vision caught his eye. Ahead of him, down an aisle of vintage Ninja Turtles and Power Rangers toys, and out the front windows, a large shadow passed by. Darren waited to see if whoever it was would walk back again, but things out in front of the store seemed still. He went back to counting his cash drawer. Suddenly, he was interrupted by a sharp, strident scratching sound on the glass, as if someone were dragging the tines of a metal rake across it. Hey, hey, stop it! Darren shouted, rushing out from behind the counter and to the locked side of his door. The scratching sound had come to an abrupt stop. Darren squinted and peered outside, but the store's lights still made it hard to see anything in the night. Suddenly, Darren watched a set of piercing yellow eyes ignite on the other side of the glass and then narrow into a menacing leer. He saw a flash of sharp teeth next, and then… crash! 
The window exploded inward. A massive hairy beast plowed through along with the shattering glass. It snarled, gnashed its jaws, and thrashed its claws. The attack was quick. Afterward, Skylark's toys and comics sat in an eerie silence. Only the scampering, galloping footsteps of the beast could be heard fleeing from the scene. Then it released a horrible howl into the night. Sean awoke the next morning, having surprisingly slept soundly all night long. His first thoughts were of Tammy's pizza. Could that pizza have been so good that I forgot all of my troubles, he thought as he rolled out of bed. He looked around the room he was in. It felt strange to him. It wasn't his room. It was a spare bedroom at his aunt and uncle's house in Grove City. The more he thought about it, he didn't even have a room anymore. His old one didn't count since his parents were in North Carolina signing the final paperwork on a new house. That's why he was forced to spend the weekend with extended family that he didn't know very well. Sean heard the muffled voices of his Uncle Curtis and Aunt Jade down the hallway. He went to the door and put an ear to it, but still couldn't make out much of what they were saying, so he cracked the door open about an inch. That was enough to catch the last moments of their conversation down the hall. "'It's never attacked anyone before. Don't you find this concerning?' Jade quietly said. There was silence from Curtis for a moment, but then he responded, "'I can't believe this is actually happening. A monster in Grove City!' Curtis let out a quick, nervous laugh. <laughs> "'Who would have ever thought, huh?' "'That poor man,' Jade said. "'I know,' Curtis responded. "'And I planned on taking Sean to Skylarks today. Guess that won't be happening.'" Uncle Curtis and Aunt Jade went silent after that so Sean emerged from his room and crept down the hallway. The floorboards creaking beneath his feet gave him away, though. As he turned the corner into the living room, he saw his aunt and uncle sitting around the TV drinking coffee. On the TV was a news reporter standing in front of a local Grove City business. At the bottom of the screen were the words, Grove City Business Owner Attacked by Local Legend, Police Baffled. Uncle Curtis was quick to turn off the TV as soon as Sean made his creaky entrance into the room. Aunt Jade stood up and put on a forced, fake smile. "'Good morning, Sean. Did you sleep okay?' "'Yeah,' Sean coldly replied. He'd quickly grown tired of his aunt and uncle's secrecy and whatever it was that had been going on in Grove City. A curfew? A monster? Sean wanted answers." After breakfast and a shower, Sean followed Uncle Curtis out the front door and was immediately stung by the brisk temperatures of the late morning hours. "'I was going to show you the comic book store today, but—' Curtis searched for the right words. "'They're closed.' Sean rolled his eyes. Did his uncle really think he was that stupid? He saw the TV screen. He heard his and Aunt Jade's hushed conversation. "'Instead, I'll take you back down to Broadway.' Curtis said, jingling the car keys in his hand. The library is amazing. We could get some ice cream at Strasser's afterwards. Oh, and the Grove City Visitor Center. That's where we should start. There's so much local flair in there, you'll really see what this town is all about. Oh, you mean aside from monsters and secrets? Sean thought to himself. He just nodded along as his uncle unlocked the car. Morning, neighbor! A man's voice shouted from behind them. Sean turned around, just as Curtis did. They saw Reese, the young twenty-something, next door raking his yard. Boarded Reese! Curtis smiled and waved. I see you got some company there, Curtis! Reese said, taking a break from his autumn chore. Bongo lay in the leaves nearby with his head up, alert, as dogs always were. This is my nephew, Sean. He's staying with us for the weekend. Reese waved again. Hi, Sean. I'm Reese. Nice to meet you. Sean nodded shyly. You too. I like your dog. Reese laughed. Oh, Bongo here? Yeah, he's a good boy. Very loyal. That's the best quality of a dog. Reese then turned his attention back to Curtis and changed the subject. 
You know, I could still use a little help in the attic, Curtis. Think you'd have an hour or so to spend this weekend? Sean watched his uncle panic and scramble for an excuse. Uh, uh, ba baby, I I'll let you know. I'm taking Sean around today, not sure what tomorrow's gonna bring. Reese nodded. He wasn't stupid. He knew Curtis was trying to avoid helping. It wasn't very neighborly. Well, you guys have a good day, Reese said. You too, Reese, Curtis said as he climbed into the car. Sean got in too, and then they drove off. The Grove City Visitor Center on Broadway was smaller than Sean expected. When his uncle said, Visitor Center, his young mind immediately went to the finale of Jurassic Park. But this place was more like a gift shop. A woman on the shorter side, wearing a sports jacket and a friendly smile, greeted Sean and Curtis when they entered. Welcome, she said in a sweet voice. What brings you guys in today? Curtis put his hand on Sean's back. My nephew is from out of town. I'm just showing him what Grove City is all about, and I figured this would be a good place to start. Absolutely. I'm Teresa Breckenridge, she said with a smile, shaking Sean's hand and then Curtis's. She looked down at Sean. Grove City has been named the best hometown in Ohio two years in a row now, so you're definitely in the presence of comfort, hospitality, and monsters. Sean impulsively said out loud, although he initially intended for it to be an inner thought. The two adults went quiet and just looked at each other. We'll just uh, look around, Curtis finally said. Teresa nodded, unsure as to how to continue the conversation. Let me know if you have any questions. Curtis began to show Sean around the store, completely ignoring the monster comment he had just blurted out. They looked at Grove City t-shirts homemade gifts, books by independent authors who lived nearby, and local baked goods. It gave Sean an idea of the tight-knit community that Grove City was. By the pictures on the wall and the books and pamphlets scattered about the store, it looked like it was a town rich in history. He also saw a blue and white sign proudly displayed that read, Grove City, Best Hometown 2023 and 2024 by Ohio Magazine. Curtis's cell phone rang and he looked at the screen. It's your Aunt Jade, he said. Give me a minute, Sean. Curtis answered the phone and stepped away, speaking softly as to not disrupt the quiet atmosphere of the store, even though there was no one else in there. Teresa walked up to Sean with her hands in the pockets of her sports jacket. Monster, huh? she said. Sean turned and faced her. Finally, he thought, someone actually acknowledged the elephant in the room. Yeah, Sean said softly so his uncle wouldn't hear him. What is going on in this town? There's a curfew? Weird secrets? Something about a monster attack last night? What's it all about? Teresa smiled and then whispered, Don't tell your uncle I said anything, she said. He clearly doesn't want you to worry, but there have been some weird sightings around town lately. People say they've seen a giant wolf standing upright on two legs. A wolf standing on two legs? Sean whispered back. You mean, are you talking about a werewolf? Teresa nodded. There have been stories of werewolves in Ohio for a long time, and it's always been speculated that we had some here in the area, but lately that speculation became more of a truth. People have seen it in every part of town. Something seems to have stirred it up, rustled it out of hiding, and now last night it attacked that poor Skylark guy. It never attacked anyone before. That would explain the secrecy and curfew, Sean said. Why won't my uncle just tell me all that then? He's just trying to keep you safe. To keep you from worrying, Teresa said. She took a deep breath. We just hope it doesn't get worse. We have no idea why the sightings and activity have escalated so much lately. A werewolf is a predator, Sean said. Probably top of the food chain. What would have it all riled up? Teresa shrugged, leaving the haunting answer to the question lingering in the air. Once Curtis was finished with his phone call, he and Sean left the visitor center. They grabbed ice cream across the street at Strasser's Ice Cream Pop and Candy Shop, and then drove around town as Curtis pointed out places he found interesting or worth showing off. But Sean wasn't paying much attention to any of it. 
He was focused on what Teresa Breckenridge had told him. Grove City had a werewolf, and for some reason that werewolf had been triggered and turned into an aggressive, dangerous threat. The day came to an end, and once the sun set, the curfew took effect. Storefronts displayed their closed-for-curfew signs, shoppers scrambled for their last-second purchases, and a heavier police presence patrolled the streets. Teresa Breckenridge walked out of the visitor center and closed the door. After arming the security system, she made sure the door was locked. She pulled her coat tightly around her body and slung her purse over her shoulder. Broadway was silent. A cold breeze flowed down the street, dead leaves scratched across the road. The festival fall flags on the light poles fluttered gently. Teresa felt a chill of unease. Something made a noise behind her and she spun around. There was nothing, no one on the sidewalk in either direction. A police car turned off of Broadway and onto Park Street only a block away. Other than that, there wasn't another car in sight. Hello? She called out, knowing that she heard something. Then a howl erupted in the night, and it was close. Teresa's heart dropped. She turned and ran, cutting down the narrow alley between businesses. Suddenly the howl ripped through the cold night air again. Teresa stopped at the end of the alley by a public parking lot. She looked up. Perched upon the top of the building, with the full moon at its back, was the werewolf. It stood on its hind legs, arched its back, and howled again. Then it crouched, locked its hungry eyes on Teresa, and pounced. <laughs> There was no hiding it now. Neither Uncle Curtis nor Aunt Jade could ignore the questions and quote-unquote elephant in the room. There was a werewolf in Grove City, and it had attacked another person, Teresa Breckenridge, the sweet woman who worked at the Grove City Visitor Center. Sean and Curtis had just seen her the previous day, so when Sean woke up again to a deja vu image of a reporter on TV, talking about a vicious attack the night before, he was naturally unnerved, scared, and worried. You're not leaving the house again, Jade insisted when she noticed Sean creep into the living room. Not until your parents get back tomorrow morning. Even though Jade acknowledged Sean's presence, Curtis hadn't. His attention was glued to the TV, never wavering. They couldn't even try to hide it now if they wanted to. The madness was too public. Over an easy breakfast of brown sugar oatmeal and milk, Curtis and Jade finally filled Sean in on everything they knew. There had always been rumors and sightings, just as Teresa had indicated. There were reports of eerie howls in the night, some of which were even caught on security footage and ring cameras around town. They'd become more frequent lately, though. People were scared. Parents were afraid to let their kids outside, especially at night. That's why the curfew had been put in place. Now the sightings and scary sounds had escalated into brutal attacks. The humble comic store owner and the friendly face at the visitor center had fallen victim to the werewolf. The big question now was, why? Why had the werewolf become so violent and enraged? Something must have happened to trigger it. The legends always describe werewolves as men or women who have been cursed, Jade said. They transform into the beast. Otherwise, they look like normal, average people. So the werewolf could be anyone, Sean concluded. Curtis nodded. Yeah, absolutely anyone. What could have stirred the creature into a rage, though, Jane wondered. Up until now, it's always just been rumored to be around. Nothing aggressive just alleged sightings. Why the sudden change to violence? It must feel threatened, Curtis said. Something in town must have changed. Curtis couldn't help but look up at Sean. The attacks didn't happen until... Sean went cold. There was no way his uncle was about to blame him for the attacks. He was innocent. Whatever was happening was a Grove City thing. It had nothing to do with his arrival it couldn't. There was a knock on the front door. 
startling all three of them at the breakfast table. Curtis caught his breath and stood up, crossing through the house and opening the front door. From where Sean and Jade still sat, they couldn't see who Curtis was talking to. Then Curtis and the man at the door both appeared in the kitchen. Sean stood up. "'Hey, Sean!' the man said. It was Reese, the next-door neighbor. Sean hesitantly waved. His uncle stepped in and said, "'Since the police are urging people to stay inside today, Reese was wondering if you'd like to help him clean out his attic. It'll give you something to do.' "'It'll also give you fifty bucks,' Reese added with a generous smile. Fifty bucks?' Sean mumbled. He thought about it for a moment, and then the fifty bucks that bounced around inside his head won him over. Sure, Sean agreed. A little while later, Curtis walked Sean next door, saw he'd made it inside safely, and then returned home to do whatever it was that Uncle Curtis was going to do. Reese stood in his living room with his hands in his pockets. Bongo sat next to him, panting. Is it okay if I pay you when we're all wrapped up? Reese asked. Sean nodded. Great! Follow me! Reese led Sean down the hall and then directed his attention to an attic hatch on the ceiling. Reese pulled the cord and a wooden ladder unfolded, lowering to the floor. After you, Reese said. Sean never realized attics made him nervous until this very moment. He swallowed and took a deep breath before he ascended the wooden steps. The attic was messy. It didn't take Sean long to realize why Reese was so needy for his uncle's help. There were boxes, bags, piles of clothing, a tall antique mirror, and a mannequin in the corner covered in a pretty extensive collection of dust and spiderwebs. Man, there's stuff everywhere, Sean said, secretly disgusted by the mess. It was in complete contrast to the neat and presentable way in which Reese was dressed and acted. Reese laughed. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to get your uncle to help me for a little while, but between you and I, I feel like he's blowing me off. Sean didn't respond. He knew the truth, and obviously Reese did too. How long have you lived here? Sean asked. In Grove City? Reese pondered with a sigh. A long time. Sean laughed. You don't look old enough to have been anywhere for a long time. Reese didn't respond to Sean's speculation. He just stuffed his hands in his pockets and looked around the attic, finally landing his gaze on the far corner. There, Reese said. We'll start by cleaning out over there. That's where I'm going to put it. Put what? Reese smiled again. I have an important delivery coming this afternoon. The mailman should be delivering it fairly soon, actually. Jeff! Sean remembered the mailman's name. Reese seemed surprised. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. You have a good memory. Isn't today Sunday? Sean asked. There's no mail delivery on Sunday. A good memory and a keen sense, Reese smirked. Actually, the mail does deliver some priority packages on Sundays. He patted Sean on the back. Start moving some of those boxes and I'll grab a broom and dustpan from downstairs. We can try to tag-team this thing and get you out of here a little quicker. Reese descended the wooden steps, leaving Sean alone in the attic. He shuffled through the hot mess, first moving the tall antique mirror out of the way. Once that was settled along the wall, he started moving boxes out of the corner. He lined them up around the mirror first, and then just started putting them wherever he felt like it. In the kitchen, Reese opened the closet door and pulled out a wooden broomstick. He reached in further to find the dustpan. Once he found it, he closed the closet door and turned around. Bongo stood in his way. Reese could tell something was wrong. What is it, boy? Reese said, kneeling down and petting his nervous dog on the head. Bongo was shaking. Something had him rattled. Reese stood up and froze. He felt it now, too. Something was wrong. A cool breeze blew through the house, letting him know that a window or door was open. There was someone in the house. Reese looked to his left, where his knife block sat on a counter. If there was an intruder, he could reach the knives. Their steel blades would certainly help fight off an attack. They just wouldn't… Suddenly the werewolf jumped up from behind Reese, raging and gnashing its teeth. Reese dropped to the ground. Bongo skittered backwards, his nails frantically clicking against the tile floor. 
Reese struggled to stand up, using the wooden broomstick as leverage, but the werewolf yanked the broomstick out of his hands and ferociously snapped it over his hairy knee. Reese's eyes widened as they focused solely on the broken, splintered ends of the broomstick. The werewolf lunged forward with the broken ends of the broomstick, stabbing downward, but Reese was quick, too quick for the werewolf. He rolled wildly until he was in the clear. He stood up and faced the hulking, hairy beast. The monster, now angered, tossed the broomsticks away and charged Reese. Reese backed up, but the wall stopped him. The werewolf opened its mouth, its teeth glistening with thick saliva. Reese had nowhere to go. He had no time to scream. Sean had stopped working in the attic. He cowered behind the tall, antique mirror, listening to chaos unfold downstairs. The crashing sounds, the snarls and growls. Sean knew it had to be another werewolf attack. He closed his eyes tightly and tried to control his breathing, thinking of poor Reese. As the house below him went silent, he waited for what felt like hours but was maybe only five minutes. He didn't hear Reese. He didn't hear Bongo. He didn't hear a monster. He thought of his aunt and uncle next door and wondered if he'd be able to make a break for it to make a push for help. Otherwise, he'd be trapped in the attic. Sean came out from behind the mirror and crept across the attic floor. The wooden planks creaked beneath him as if the house was groaning in pain. He slowly made his way down the steps of the pull-down ladder and cautiously turned the corner and into the kitchen where he assumed the chaotic struggle had taken place. He was right. On the floor, bunched up against the far wall, was Reese. He was surrounded by broken glass and covered in deep lacerations. Sean covered his mouth, trying not to scream or throw up, and spun around, rushing through the house for the front door. He threw it open and was stopped dead in his tracks by Jeff, the mailman, who was setting a large package down on the front steps. Jeff, just as startled as Sean was, jumped back and grabbed his chest. Whoa! Jeff gasped. I didn't know you, you were… I didn't expect… He looked next door to his aunt and uncle's house. Are you in the right house? Behind Sean, echoing through the house, was the sound of a door opening. The back door in the kitchen, perhaps? Sean looked back to Jeff, panicked. The werewolf is here! Sean exclaimed. It killed Reese! It's… Suddenly, Jeff was attacked from behind. But it wasn't from the sharp claws or razor-like teeth of a werewolf. It was from Reese smacking him over the back of the head with a splintered, broken broomstick. Jeff crumbled to the ground, and Sean watched the mailman fall unconscious. Sean looked up at Reese, who was smiling maliciously. The deep lacerations that covered his body all healed before Sean's very eyes, like a magic trick. Sean felt weak, faint. It was all too much for him. His eyes rolled into the back of his head, and he collapsed to the floor just inside of the house. When Sean opened his eyes, he was back in the attic, laying on an old mattress atop a pile of musty sheets and blankets. His eyes opened in heavy blinks, his surroundings coming back to him as blurry images and muffled noises, almost as if he were underwater. He heard something metal clanging. He heard scampering and thrashing. Sean rolled over, opening up his vision to the entirety of the attic and what he saw made him sit up as quickly as he could and press his back against the wall. It was the werewolf, the vicious beast that had been terrorizing Grove City. It paced back and forth, puffing angrily within the claustrophobic confines of a shimmering silver cage. Next to the cage on its side sat the box that Jeff had sat on the porch. It was open, with smaller boxes and instructions from inside of it pouring out. Sean could see that the instructions were on how to put together the large silver cage that now took up a good portion of the attic, in the exact spot where Reese wanted Sean to start cleaning up. The werewolf, noticing that Sean was now awake, lowered its head and leered at him from across the attic with its piercing yellow eyes. It snarled, thick saliva dripping from between its teeth. Oh, stop it! 
a voice said. Reese stepped out from the shadows, from behind the antique mirror, and stood in front of it as he smacked the silver cage as hard as he could. Bongo, his loyal dog, was at his side. The werewolf cowered and slunk back into a sitting position. Sean stood up slowly and stepped off the mattress. You were, you were dead, Sean trembled. I, I saw you in the kitchen. <laughs> I've been dead for a long time, Reese said with a sarcastic chuckle, hearkening back to their earlier conversations. Uh, undead, to be exact. The word undead bounced around briefly in Sean's head before he landed on another word. Vampire. Sean now noticed something else. Reese didn't display a reflection in the tall, antique mirror he now stood in front of. Sean's heart skipped a beat. Of course, he thought. Werewolves and vampires. One of the world's oldest rivalries was playing out right here in Grove City. You look like you have a lot of questions, Reese said. Don't worry, you're not in danger. Jeff, on the other hand… Reese turned back to the beast. It cowered lower and then began to transform. Its fur receded, as did its snout and teeth. Within seconds, Jeff was the one within the silver cage, crouched and afraid in torn clothing. He stood up and grit his teeth, taking a step forward but careful not to come into contact with the silver bars of the cage. He glared at Reese. You killed my brother! Jeff growled. Reese smirked. <laughs> I wish it could have been sooner, but I must give credit where credit is due. You and your brother were hard to track down. Nice choice by staying in the shadows all these years. If it wasn't for Bongo, I wouldn't have had the help needed to really narrow you guys down. A dog can always track a dog." <coughs> Jeff's breathing picked up, his eyes narrowed. <laughs> I didn't realize losing him would send you into this sort of animalistic rage, though. Reese laughed. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm stopping you now before you hurt someone else. How many people would have to lose their lives because you're upset, Jeff? Jeff slunk back further into the cage, shadows crawling over his face. We both can't live here, Jeff. Werewolves and vampires, we just don't mix. You know that, Reese said. But after striking up a relationship with my loyal Bongo here, who effortlessly helped me to snuff you two out, I began to wonder, what if? What if a vampire could domesticate a werewolf and use it to his advantage? What if, under the right circumstances, a vampire and a werewolf could be the ultimate team-up of horrors? Sean just stood back, watching and listening. At first, he believed Reese when he told him he wasn't in any danger. But now, as he watched Reese discussing teaming up two monsters for a reign of horror, he wasn't so sure. What would those horrors consist of? Sean was convinced now that he was in danger, just as all of Grove City was. Sean tried to quietly shuffle himself toward the attic door, but stopped when a cackle from Reese sent a cold shiver through his body. You might not be able to see me in the mirror, but I can see you, Reese said. He spun around and faced Sean, now bearing a set of fangs and black eyes. He hissed and raised his arms up. It was now or never. Sean bolted for the open attic door and dropped down into the house. He didn't stick the landing and crumbled to the floor. Scrambling to his feet, he raced for the kitchen, but a heavy gust of wind whirled up beside him, cutting him off, and manifested itself as Reese, his fangs still showing, his eyes still as black as night. Sean stopped and looked around for a weapon or anything to defend himself, but came up empty. I've lived here a long time, Sean. This is my town. Reese hissed. And now, with the werewolf population in Grove City under my control, I don't see why I can't help myself to a celebratory feast. <laughs> Reese raised his hands up limply in front of his body. I think. I'll start by tapping your neck," he malevolently said. That's always a classy move. As Reese took a step toward Sean, a knock on the back door shattered the tension. Sean prayed it was salvation. Reese was annoyed by the interruption. 
Bongo, however, raced into the room and wagged his tail vigorously at the back door. Reese's entire body turned around as if he were on a swivel and faced the door. After a moment of unnerving silence, Bongo's tail stopped wagging, and he backed away. The door then blasted in off its hinges, crashing into Reese and knocking him to the floor. Two large werewolves stood intimidatingly in the doorway and then made their way in. Sean backed up and hid underneath the kitchen table. One of the werewolves, heaving its body up and down with each massive breath it took, grabbed Reese by the neck and slammed him into the wall. The second werewolf grabbed the closest wooden chair and smashed it into a hundred pieces on the floor. Only keeping one of the splintered legs in its grasp. Everything happened so fast, Reese barely had time to react. With one last hiss from the vampire, the werewolf plunged the broken chair leg deep into Reese's chest. As, of course, a wooden stake through the heart was the only way to eliminate such a threat. Reese's body turned black, like ash, and spilled to the ground in a dusty cloud. Both werewolves then began to transform back to their human forms, right in front of Sean. When he saw who they were, he was stunned at first, surprised, but then it all made sense. If you're bitten by a werewolf, you become a werewolf. Teresa Breckenridge stood in the kitchen, along with a bearded man sporting a Skylark's toys and comics ball cap. Teresa extended her hand and helped Sean out from underneath the table and to his feet. She smiled. You don't look that surprised, she said. You both were, were attacked by a, a werewolf, Sean said. Now you are werewolves. Teresa nodded, as did Darren Neff, the humble owner of Skylarks. I was pretty mad when Jeff attacked me, but now I understand why he did, Darren said. Being the last of his kind in the area, he knew there was a chance of permanent extinction. He was recruiting help, a future. And honestly, Darren said, looking his body over, this is pretty darn cool. I mean, who doesn't dream of being a werewolf? The morgue is going to realize our bodies are gone soon enough. Teresa said to Darren, but also for Sean's sake. We need to get Jeff and leave town to settle somewhere else. Somewhere safe where no one will recognize our faces. Jeff's locked in a silver cage, Sean said, but, but I can help get him out. Teresa smiled. Thank you, Sean. That would be wonderful. You saved me, Sean said. Let me save you guys. The next morning, a new mystery around Grove City began to spread like wildfire. Two corpses from the morgue, both victims of werewolf attacks, had disappeared, and the locals now began to fear the walking dead, zombies, while others were closer than they thought, suggesting the two corpses were now werewolves themselves. There was simply just no sign of them. And Sean knew why. Teresa Breckenridge and Darren Neff had left town along with Jeff the mailman. He wasn't sure where they would end up, but he knew their goal was to live peacefully somewhere, hidden away from any other vampiric threats. Uncle Curtis and Aunt Jade remained oblivious to the horrors that had transpired right next door to them, and although Reese's sudden absence was certainly strange to them, they just assumed it was another example of a young man moving on to bigger and better things with his life. It's that internet, Curtis vaguely said, without much explanation behind his Reese vanishing theory, but it was enough to satisfy him and Jade. When Sean's parents picked him up, they thanked Curtis and Jade for their hospitality and said their goodbyes. Sean settled into the back seat of the family car for the drive home before eventually heading down to North Carolina, forever planning to keep the identities of the Grove City werewolves a secret. After a couple of weeks in North Carolina, Sean received a copy of the Grove City Messenger in the mail from his uncle, with a handwritten note that said, Thought you'd like this to remember your time here in Grove City. Fun fact, the sightings seem to have stopped now. There was a front-page article written by Andrea Cordell titled, Grove City, Home of Monsters? Skimming through the article, Sean read about the sightings 
the mystery and intrigue that surrounded the recent werewolf activity, plus a whole slew of other unknown horrors that may have lurked just beneath the surface of the town. And it seemed that Andrea really did her research on the local ominous goings-on, because, based on what Sean could tell from the article, Grove City may have had even more than just a werewolf and vampire problem. Now, Sean was very curious about the ghosts that were said to haunt the Grove City Library after hours. But that would have to be a story for another time. The End Microterrors would like to thank Darren Neff from Skylark's Toys and Comics, Teresa Breckenridge from the Grove City Visitor Center, Andrea and Deborah Cordell from the Grove City Messenger, Mike Strasser from Strasser's Ice Cream Pop and Candy Shop, Tyler and Heidi Walker from Tammy's Pizza, and Casey Cox and Meredith Wickham from the Grove City Library for letting us use their likeness and mention their businesses in our story. By the way, there are no werewolves or vampires in Grove City, Ohio. That we are aware of. I'm your Micro Terrors narrator, Darren Marlar. From me and Scott Donnelly, we hope you have a very happy and safe Halloween. Thank you for listening to Micro Terrors. Join us each Saturday for another scary story. For more fun, visit our website at microterrors.com where you can get the latest Micro Terrors news, read fun facts about each story, sign up for our monthly newsletter, and even send in your own scary story for us to tell. Plus, you can become one of the terrified by joining the fan club at microterrors.com to enjoy exclusive perks like reading stories a week early receiving complimentary books, and communicating directly with Micro Terrors writer and creator Scott Donnelly. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram using the handle at Micro Terrors. I hope you'll join us again soon for Micro Terrors – Scary Stories for Kids. <laughs>